Well, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you for attending and participating. I'm Paul Crooker, a graduate of the Booth Executive MBA program and a member of the Booth San Francisco Bay Area Alumni Board of Directors. Today's event, U Chicago Reengineers Engineering, Quantum, Immunoengineering, and Materials for Sustainability is jointly sponsored by the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering, or PME, and the Booth School of Business. <clears throat> PME's mission reminds me of the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman's visionary idea in lecture on there is plenty of room at the bottom to discover, invent, design, and engineer devices, materials, processes, machines, and products that take advantage of the physics at atomic, molecular, and cellular scales. The research and know-how created by the PME are needed to transform vision into reality. Building on research, engineering, and business innovations are needed to scale breakthroughs practically and economically. The goal of today's program, goals of today's program are to introduce the PME's leaders, research, and facilitate engagement between the PME and the San Francisco Bay Area entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem. Today, we are fortunate to have three distinguished speakers and PME research leaders. They are Dr. Matthew Terrell. Matt, Matt Terrell is the Dean of the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering, which was established by the University of Chicago in 2011 with Matt as the founding director. Matt's own research, research is in polymer science and biomolecular materials. David, Dr. David Oshalam, the Lou Pro Family Professor of Molecular Engineering and the Deputy Dean for Space, Infrastructure and Facilities. The third speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Hubble, the, the Eugene Bell Professor of Tissue Engineering and Deputy Dean for Development. Please refer to the event announcements for our speakers' bios and other background information. Please place your questions into the chat QA at any time so it can be addressed immediately or during the Q&A session. So with that, my, my introductory remarks are complete. Uh, let's get started. Matt, the floor is yours. Oops, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, it's really an honor to be invited to address this group and to tell you what we've been doing for the last nine years in building a really distinctive new kind of engineering program at the University of Chicago which, as many of you may know, has never had engineering, and it's now uh, 130, almost 130-year history. This is an overview of our campus, uh, looking north toward Chicago, and uh, we are situated largely in this building toward the upper right at the corner of uh, 57th and Ellis, across from the, the Regenstein and Mansueto Library. And uh, we have grown so quickly that we are now occupying several other buildings and uh, planning to uh, expand our territory uh, to the north and to the northwest. Um, as I said, this was the, uh, the first, in, this is the first engineering program ever at the University of Chicago. But a couple of my friends from the Ivy League found this in the Brown engineering library uh, from uh, 1903. This Technology Quarterly is the forerunner of the MIT Technology Review, where a professor named Cortho uh, had suggested back in 1903 that the University of Chicago start an engineering program. Uh, he said that he thought if you look at the top of the right-hand column, it ought to be called the University College of Engineering and Architecture. Uh, we uh, focused on 
much smaller scale things in uh, starting a uh, first an institute and now a school of molecular engineering. It's really incumbent on us in doing something new like this to lead in new directions and to make sure that we are doing something that traditional engineering schools uh, can't do. And what that is, is to operate explicitly very close to small scale molecular level science in physics, chemistry, biology, computation. Uh, and it's also an explicit or at least an implicit um, uh, statement of what we're not doing. We're not doing large scale civil engineering or architectural engineering or aerospace engineering. We are focusing ourselves at the interface between science and engineering and focusing on translating scientific advances into useful technologies. We differ from traditional engineering schools because of a inherently multidisciplinary organization. We do not have traditional departments and we're not focused on what the so-called engineering disciplines have been. By that, I mean chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, bioengineering. Those distinctions actually, while they're useful for some things in organizing curricula, they kind of put artificial uh, divides between engineering activities. PME, which is what we call the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering for short, is focused on what the engineering disciplines can do. And that's the unique University of Chicago approach to um, engineering research and education. We believe that engineering is the discipline, the entire spectrum of translating science into technology. And so we're focused on themes, not departments. We're focused on big problems and training our students how to tackle them. And by saying we're not reproducing a traditional engineering school, we don't mean to be putting them down. There's a lot of good ones, but the world didn't need us to start an engineering school at Chicago if what we were going to do was to copy MIT or Stanford or Berkeley. We are striking out in new directions. I like to say that we go beyond interdisciplinarity to a convergent approach. And by that, the thing that's different from interdisciplinary is it's not just a cooperation among different disciplines, but it's research driven by a specific compelling problem. And you're going to hear some things about this when we talk about quantum information, when, when David talks about quantum information or Jeff talks about immunoengineering. And this requires, um, really a deep integration across disciplines, not just cooperation, but adding new uh, tools uh, to tackle big problems. We do have a nice new building. This is an artist sketch of what I showed you from an aerial uh, photograph uh, in which we have the laboratories for uh, the, uh, many of the laboratories for which uh, we're going to describe the work that's going on uh, today. There's David looking into a very powerful facility that's in the lower level of this building called the Pritzker Nanofabrication Facility, which is a 10,000 square foot clean room, which uh, I believe is, is comparable to the state of the art in any academic institution in the United States right now. I came to the University of Chicago most immediately from Berkeley, where I was the chair of the bioengineering department with the authority to hire 25 new faculty members. And if your uh, multiplication of rows and columns is good, uh, we blew right past that. We now have 39 faculty members, uh, some of whom are joint appointments with physics or biology or uh, chemistry. But uh, uh, David and Jeff and I are among the really first founding faculty members that have created the, the technical pillars of uh, the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering. Uh, so anyway, that's the, the, the spectrum of names. And I, I just like to spread it out there so people can see some kind of uh, concrete uh, image of the capacity that we now have in the men and women on our faculty. As I said, there's, there's three 
technical research themes that you're going to hear about, in this case from right to left uh, today. And each of them have about uh, a dozen people affiliated them, with them in some way. But these are thematic research directions, not departments. Uh, you'll see numerous names listed in more than one column, and that's great. Uh, while we do want to have strong themes, we want to have interconnections among the themes, so we don't label people. It's just a, this is just a kind of a rough sketch of where different people uh, contribute. And if I put disciplinary uh, backgrounds behind these people, you will see that we have faculty members whose training is in biology, chemistry, physics, material science, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, bioengineering, and electrical engineering and computer science. So we are one group of 30 some faculty members uh, with a great diversity of intellectual and academic backgrounds. Uh, I also put a, a web link down at the bottom of this page to point out that one of our uh, uh, faculty members who was pictured but is not in one of these lists is uh, Nancy Kowalik, who leads a program in the dramatic arts focused on uh, science and technology within the PME, and the program is called STAGE. If you go to the PME website and look for STAGE, uh, you won't have any trouble finding the, the kinds of activities and interesting programs that uh, STAGE does both um, performance and research in. Um, so I said we have 39 faculty members. We have um, 14 assistant professors. Uh, 15 full professors and, and three of the mid-career variety, although David and Jeff and I consider ourselves mid-career as well. Um, we have seven secondary appointments, meaning people whose primary appointment is in physics or chemistry or biology. A very important aspect of um, the PME is that it has been the agent of greatly enhancing the cooperation between the campus and the Argonne National Laboratory, which has been managed by the University of Chicago, but at a distance uh, since the Manhattan Project. And we now have a lot more joint appointments. David may say something about a major project that he's pursuing there, and the Polymer Group is pursuing things. So you see some facts and figures here. Now we, we, we are already have over 200 graduate students, and we have 32 PhD alumni, most of whom, not all of whom, have gone into industrial jobs, some in the Bay Area. We have about 80 postdocs. Uh, 21 of our postdoctoral alumni, so far at least, that may not be a totally up-to-date figure. And we have placed our postdocs on the faculties of several California universities and other universities around the country. Our undergraduate program is growing, and we actually teach a lot of non-majors in various things. And the number of undergraduates indicating that they intend to study engineering at the University of Chicago is growing. Uh, Jeff may say something, or certainly could say something in the Q&A about uh, new venture creation and uh, patents and uh, other, other things that are really societal outgrowths of um, the Pritzker School for Molecular Engineering. That's a very fast uh, overview of uh, what's going on. The, the principal thing I want you to remember is that we've built very rapidly, but in the process have created three strong, important technical themes of uh, molecular engineering. I should probably close by saying that, uh, you know, molecular engineering is our branding for small scale engineering. We don't literally mean uh, engineering molecules. We mean engineering systems from the molecular level up. And that's what we've created at the University of Chicago. With the Pritzker gift, uh, 
naming our school uh, a little over a year ago, the university has said that we can double in size over the next uh, decade. So you see some images of what we are with immunoengineering, material system, quantum engineering, and stage being our principal pillars in 2020. But we are thinking about several kinds of new thematic concentrations and fortifying our cross-cutting capabilities for 2030. Uh, we're thinking very seriously about uh, launching a new program in uh, molecular engineering for space science and engineering. We're thinking about expanding our efforts in biological engineering into uh, biological systems design. And then, as it says at the very bottom, enhancing our cross-cutting capabilities in computation, artificial intelligence, material synthesis, and instrument development. So that's a thumbnail sketch of the evolution and the future uh, of uh, PME. And uh, I will now uh, turn the floor over to uh, David Alshalom to talk about quantum engineering. Thank you, Matt. David and I are not actually in the same place but we're using similar versions of the same virtual background. That's right. So thank you, thank you very much. It's uh, actually, it's fun for me to talk about quantum science and technology to the Booth alumni, who we view as the users of this technology down the road. So thank you very much for listening to me uh, this afternoon. So just to get everybody on the same page, as Matt pointed out, one of the fun things about being at the Pritzker School of Medical Engineering is an opportunity to build something from the ground up that's very new, a new type of technology that's hitting the country and the world. And just so we're clear to all of you, although I'm guessing many of you in the Bay Area have been hearing about quantum computing, you know, what is quantum engineering? So apologies for spending a minute on this one, but you know, at the very smallest scales of individual electrons and individual atoms, these properties of nature at that scale behave in ways that we don't see today that are driven by the laws of quantum physics. And these laws provide a fundamentally new way of creating and controlling information. And this is the genesis of quantum technology. The fact that it's actually been easier and easier over time to actually do this in the lab. And people have discovered ways to actually produce technologies that are scalable. And these quantum technologies are based on two unusual properties of nature. One is the fact that Unlike our technologies today, say in computing, where a bit can be a zero or a one, information can be in two states, a quantum bit, one atom or one electron, can exist simultaneously in an infinite number of zeros in one states, an infinite number of combinations. The second property is just entanglement. You can create information in multiple quantum bits or multiple transistors, if you like, that are connected even if they're not physically connected these entanglements or these connections can take place even over long distances on a chip, across a state, across a country, or even across a galaxy. And these combinations have really launched this really different way of thinking about information. And at Chicago, when in the PME, we've tried to build up a community of people who think about engineering the science in new directions. So in the Bay Area, you probably heard about one of the three big areas of this field, which is quantum computing. Through this entanglement, you can begin to make machines with a pretty small number of quantum transistors, if you like. But because they're entangled, they can acquire properties that well surpass supercomputers, even future extrapolations we can think of supercomputers in the next 10 or 20 years. But in addition to computing, we can create new technologies based on communications and sensing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these communications, but that in the short term has generated a lot of excitement right now in the country, ways to build on hackable networks, using as entangled links to teleport information over millions of locations instantly, and also build sensors at the atomic scale that can go into biological systems, probe gravity, take MRI down to the level of single molecules that even control information one bond at a time. So it's a pretty exciting direction right now for the field. And uh, we'll talk just a little bit about that. 
So what about business? I appreciate that I'm speaking to Booth alumni here. And where does all this fit in the business world? And oddly enough, you know, a couple of the big drivers of this field right now are the business communities where many large businesses have launched quantum technology groups. JP Morgan has a large group in New York, for example. Credit Suisse has a large group. They're growing all over the world. And their interest is in finance, how algorithms with quantum computers can be used for very secure transactions, high-speed trading, and delocalizing information, including finances. Transportation logistics, distributed energy grids, and smart grids can take advantage of unusual quantum computing schemes, but even optimization algorithms. You know, one of our partners here at the PME is Boeing that talk about the millions of parts that are needed to assemble a plane. How do you know which order to do them efficiently? You know, they claim after about 100 planes, they're pretty good at building an airplane, say a 777. But if you knew in day one, what well, you knew after 100 airplanes, it would have an enormous impact financially. In the pharmaceutical and healthcare industries, uh, pharmaceutical companies have formed their own quantum consortia now. Um, to look at precision sensing and molecules and interactions, how quantum machines could do quantum chemistry to try and determine the role of pharmaceuticals as they're synthesized, and how you can control cellular dynamics at the level of the individual cells. So it's exciting to think about where this is going, and you know, maybe the, one of the most exciting things is we don't really know, you know where these will, uh, biggest applications will take place, but we know they'll happen. So I want to say one thing quickly about uh, communication security. Matt brought it up because his area has helped us tie very closely to Argonne National Labs. I'm sorry you're seeing the sunlight come through my window here, which, <laughs> you know, which I appreciate being in Chicago as I've moved from California. So like a plant, I'm absorbing as much as I can. But uh, for communication security, we were interested in trying to build these entangled states, build a test bed for quantum communication, a real world environment where in Chicago and in the suburbs, there could be big temperature changes, big environmental changes. And Argonne has launched a project, the Quantum Loop, which is a 52 mile optical fiber network to create entangled pairs across the network as a test bed for both industry and academia. It'll extend another 30 miles to Fermi National Lab in the coming year. And it's the foundations what we believe will be a national quantum internet program where banks, telecommunications company, uh, security information companies can come and start using this test bed with different technologies and a plug and play uh, assembly technique to try their technology and see how robust it is in the real world. So I wanna say a little bit about quantum computing because that's something people are most familiar about and it's, it is very exciting, it's very challenging. And at the PME, we're taking both a short-term and a longer-term approach taking approaches that we believe are now scalable using superconducting materials to build quantum bits, but also working with companies such as Intel and HRL and others to build scalable solid state quantum bits to think about next generation technologies maybe in the next decade. So why is all this interesting? Just so you appreciate this today, if you want to double the speed of say the laptops we're all using right now, and a Pentium chip typically now has maybe 700 million transistors in it, to double the speed of our laptop computers, we take a second chip and we double the number of transistors. And that roughly doubles the computation power. But in a quantum technology, because everything is entangled, to double the number of quantum transistors, you just add one. Just one transistor will double the computation power. So you can see where this is going. Even if you had a small number of quantum transistors, say 10,000, tiny compared to what you have today, say in your phone. You know, 10,000 quantum transistors that are entangled, you know, adding one more quantum transistors increases your computational power to two to the 10,000 fold. So these are enormous numbers. And this is why people are excited about the potential of quantum computing. So today, even if you build a 200 quantum bit computer, which is really, incredibly small, it's hard to even find something like that today with our existing technology. That computer could contain more memory states than atoms in the observable universe. So having this immense power of computation is really exciting and thinking about what problems you could solve down the line. And in the PME, we've hired theorists and experimentalists, as Matt pointed out, across the different disciplines using inorganic and organic assembly techniques to try and build these quantum bit machines, control the entanglement, and use them for sensing and biological systems, 
quantum memories for communication, and also superconducting systems for computation. Sensors are very important, and we're pushing very hard the limits of sensing to think about placing individual quantum sensors inside um, living entities. There are projects within the PME and across the biological sciences to put these quantum sensors in living cells. There's one that you can see on the bottom in a human endothelial cell that's uh, sitting, those little red dots are individual quantum states probing the electric and magnetic fields at the interface of these cells. These techniques can look at single nuclei now at room temperature. And to put that in perspective, traditional MRI scans that some of you might have experienced in a hospital might look at 10 to the 20th to 10 to the 22 nuclei. These quantum centers look at one over 20 orders of magnitude improvement in resolution. And think about, in fact, using individual nuclei to store information, not just probe things biologically. People are exploring quantum technologies as early warning systems for tremors around the earth, for volcanic uh, sensing and earthquake detection. Look at the dynamics of living cells, how you can image things with unprecedented resolution. And also in high energy science and astrophysics, deploy these quantum sensors as ways to look at dark matter and look at the origins of the universe. So people are looking all over the place at what the applications might be for this area. Not surprisingly, this field is now a global entity and there's competition across, across the globe. Virtually every country has launched a national quantum technology program, major programs in China, the EU, Australia, Japan, Canada, Singapore. They've all launched national programs. Uh, a few years ago, Japan launched one of the first satellites used to generate entangled states from space to earth platforms for communication. That helped uh, generate a response in the United States and helped launch the National Quantum Initiative right before Christmas in 2018, which was a $1.2 billion allocation to launch quantum information science over the next five years in the US through building national centers through the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation and NIST. Over 600 million has been assigned to the Department of Energy to build national centers in the United States. And there's a national competition taking place right now uh, and uh, the PME is heavily engaged in leading one of them with Argonne National Labs. And collaboration is really critical in this field. And one of the nice things of doing this in an enterprise like the PME is that, as Matt pointed out, collaboration is built in from the bottom up. It's not something we have to force, it's the way we're designed. And that's an enormous advantage in this particular field. So University of Chicago has always had very strong science programs uh, particularly in the areas of quantum science through physics and chemistry, computer science, astronomy and astrophysics. But the PME has created a quantum engineering program, one of the first in the country, already with 14 new faculty and growing. And as Matt mentioned, the strength of this field is to think about it as a new discipline that cuts across traditional boundaries to identify and grab opportunities as they appear. And we're really lucky to have the resources Matt mentioned, like the nanofabrication facility, this 10,000 square foot nanofab, which is one of the best in the country. It also helps us launch a strong graduate program, which is one of the big challenges in quantum engineering. How do we create a quantum ready workforce for the United States? Where will these employees come from, both for, for existing companies and startup uh, activities that will need trained scientists and engineers in quantum technology. And uh, if we have an undergraduate quantum track in molecular engineering, there's a graduate track. And working closely with the Polsky Center on campus, we have a venture fellows program, an innovation fund, and working with Argonne, their chain of reaction innovations program to help drive companies in this area. And the students are really excited about all of these and working, uh, working quite hard in them. A few years ago, the PME launched the Chicago Quantum Eng uh, Exchange. It's a new idea based in the PME at the University of Chicago to foster collaborations and joint projects between industry, national laboratories, and academia. It was formed with the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Argonne, and Fermi Lab as the cornerstones, and then later brought in the University of Wisconsin and Northwestern University as academic partners. It launched in 2017, and now we have over $65 million in federal funding happening to our members with almost 150 researchers across these institutions in the Chicago area. It's allowed us to attack opportunities with companies that we couldn't do individually. 
We have seven corporate partners with IBM and Boeing, HRL and Rigetti, Cold Quanta, Quantum Opus, and Applied Materials, working very closely with us and actually funding programs in the PME at the University of Chicago. And we have six more partners that we'll be announcing at the end of the month. We work with the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, which is an industrial organization formed as part of the national initiative to get American companies sharing information uh, to deal with some of these challenges. There are 75 companies in the QEDC. P33 is a Chicago-based organization to help build these technology platforms for companies in Chicago. We have two international members now uh, in Delft in the Netherlands and at the University of New South Wales in Australia to tie into both the EU programs and the programs in Australia. And finally, I wanna say that we're working very hard in training the engineering uh, people of tomorrow in the quantum area. We launched a pilot program with the National Science Foundation called the QuizNet program to create a new way to train students who do their PhDs in concert with industrial scientists. And the NSF actually augments their salary to do this for three years. IBM has contributed uh, five postdoctoral fellows to spend time working jointly between universities and their laboratories on areas of quantum technology. We've launched a certificate programs to retrain industrial scientists to get them to pivot into the areas of quantum science and engineering. And we've used the CQE to offer a spotlight series where students can learn what goes on in these companies and what the opportunities are. So thank you very much. This gives you a snapshot of what's happening here in the PME in quantum engineering. And I will stop sharing my, sheen, my screen to turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, David. Great, thank you, David. Uh, so I'd like to uh, give you an overview of uh, what we're doing in the PME in the area of immunoengineering. When we founded uh, the Pritzker School for Molecular Engineering, uh, we wanted to address key issues in uh, biology and biotechnology, biomedical sciences, and we chose to focus on immunology, cancer biology, and also the interface of immunology and cancer biology rather than address uh, wide, wider areas of biology. So, uh, so what do we mean by immunoengineering? So we're taking engineering approaches and applying them toward actually both basic, but as well translational immunology. So I've got an overview in these slides on what we mean by translational immunology and immunoengineering. And then with a few vignettes, uh, one of the vignettes comes from Melody Swartz's laboratory in, uh, in the PME, and then two from my laboratory in the PME. So immunology is key to many diseases and a key to many uh, therapeutics. I mean, therapeutic approaches are driven in immunology. So more chronic diseases are known uh, to involve immune dysfunction. So cancer involves immune dysfunction. Uh, so for example, cancer cells are rising all the time in the organism, but they're being killed most of the time. And the successful cancers are the ones that escape immune detection to proliferate and come on to uh, go on to cause a tumor. Autoimmune disease is obvious, uh, the uh, immune uh, dysfunction, where one has an exuberant immune response to recognize self and try to uh, attack self. The incidence of autoimmune diseases in, is increasing, especially asthma and allergy. So if you went back to, to my childhood, for example, I never heard of the idea of a peanut allergy. Now it's like one out of 13 children are allergic to peanuts. So these are incidents of type one diabetes is increasing. And moreover, there are therapeutic drugs that are developed by biotechnology industry that have a, an Achilles a heel of being immunogenic, such that the, the, uh, the patient receiving those drugs develops immunity and then rejects them as it were, thus rejecting the therapy that's uh, available to, uh, to, to treat them. They're also immune modulating therapeutics. Uh, so one sees uh, on, on uh, tele advertised on television, variety of therapeutics to uh, treat osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Crohn's disease, variety of immune dysfunctions. So the immune regulation system is highly complex. And that means that it really it lends itself to engineering analysis. We're accustomed to, in to analyzing networks of information systems of reaction networks, and that's what we're doing here. 
So on the, on the one hand, uh, one thinks of say cancer, where we, you, uh, the, the, you would like to engineer the system to recognize mutated proteins in cancer and reject it. You'd like to reject infectious diseases, for example, the you know, key right now thinking of COVID-19. But on the other hand, uh, one does not want to reject oneself. So we're not only self proteins and autoimmunity, but also the various proteins in your gut. Uh, so we have to be tolerized to those proteins in our gut. Otherwise, it's, it's like you have Montezuma's revenge every day of the week. Uh, so, uh, and then environmental allergens as well. Uh, as you know from reading about the microbiome in the newspapers, we're more than half uh, microbial, non-human, and we have to maintain immunological tolerance to that. So these areas of translation immunology, uh, we seek to, to monitor the immune system, to control the immune system, and then even to predict the immune system uh, in, the, in the course of, of uh, diagnosis to, ranging to therapy. In cancer, infectious disease, autoimmunity, allergy, asthma, which are, which are somehow related. Uh, so and in the PME then, we have several programs underway Engineering, as, as Matt said in the beginning, from the molecular level up, uh, some molecular therapeutics, nanomaterial therapeutics in immunology. Engineering cellular systems as well. Uh, perhaps you've read in the newspapers about CAR T cells, uh, genetically engineered T cells, immune cells, T cells that are taken out of the body, engineered and reintroduced in the body to kill a tumor. So they're active programs in, in uh, both cellular engineering for immune system and then tissue engineering, and I'll come to a vignette on that. In terms of micro devices, there's extensive work in the PME on engineering micro devices for high throughput bioanalytics. One reads about uh, uh, instruments being able to analyze, you know, 10,000 patients a day or subjects a day for COVID-19 positivity. It's possible to do things that are much more complex and much more sophisticated that, than that using micro devices. And then as well, computation. Uh, so mathematical modeling, uh, computational modeling, and machine learning approaches to analyze the immune system. So I wanted to give you three vignettes of work going on in the PME in different areas of immunoengineering. The first one from Melody Swartz's laboratory being in tissue engineering approaches. Tissue engineering is an area that's been my, mainly used in regenerative medicine, in bone repair and skin repair, for example. But here, using for immunotherapy screening in this first vignette. So she has developed uh, in vitro avatars, she calls avatars, of the tumor immune response for personalized immunotherapy. Wouldn't it be nice if you could be a cancer patient and be screened beforehand to predict response to therapy before you actually undergo that therapy? In fact, there could be many therapies that would be appropriate for you, some more effective than others, and it'd be great to not have to test them one at a time, wait till one fails to try another. But if one could take a sample, a biopsy from a tumor, and culture it in the laboratory in an engineered system to allow exposure to different therapies before you actually start therapy as a patient, just therapy of your biopsy, of your tissue sample. So she's developed in vitro systems that allow the, the full physiological, we call it organotypic culture, the full physiological characteristics of the culture system to be at play. So just as an image, uh, so here these are tumor cells in green uh, that are co-cultured with immune cells in red. And one can follow many aspects of tumor immune responses. So as I play this movie, so the immune cells are killing the, the, the uh, tumor cells. So they, they don't just disappear, they're being uh, destroyed, they're being lysed. So one can, can use these in vitro systems to study even complex effects of like an immune cell killing a tumor cell, but all in vitro, all without subjecting the patient to the therapy itself. So one can go to different levels of complexity. So for example, here, looking at, uh, at uh, CAR T cell therapy, adoptive cell therapy, which is effective uh, in, in reducing tumor volumes. So tumors in animals respond to this. Some tumors respond poorly, some tumors respond better. 
uh, and, and then uh, animals, uh, some animals survive uh, for long periods of time, but others for a short period of time. There are also vaccine approaches that are be develop, being developed against cancer, not to vaccinate to prevent you de from developing an infectious disease, but to vaccinate to treat a disease like cancer that you would have been developed. So where some tumors don't respond well at all to, to vaccination therapy and other tumors like tumor B respond quite well such that most animals are completely cured by the vaccine response. So what Melody Swartz has been able to do is use these in vitro systems to say, let's not just vaccinate the subject and see what happens. Let's vaccinate a biopsy in the laboratory and see what happens and then predict based on that what therapy would be most effective for use in the patient with strong correlation between in vitro response and in vivo response. So in terms of cancer immunotherapy, there are also molecular therapies that are being explored. So I'm sure you've read about, uh, about checkpoint blockade immunotherapy, or sometimes it's just called immunotherapy. There was a Nobel Prize one on this topic recently, where one identifies mechanisms by which tumor cells fool the immune system to prevent the immune system from killing the tumor cells. Uh, molecules with names like program death one, program death ligand one. Uh, so these molecules prevent the immune response from killing a tumor that would otherwise kill it. And so this has been the basis of developing drugs that inhibit these pathways. The drugs uh, that, that have their, their names shown here, drugs that are billion dollar drugs, uh, even many billion dollar drugs, but that are still for all those billions effective in like a third of the patients. So there exists a, a great deal of room for improvement uh, if the, if the, and, and value to be gained as well. So as an, a vignette of an approach that we're exploring, uh, so one of these, uh, the, the, the features of these tumors that don't respond well to tumors is that they're not very inflamed. And if the tumor is not very inflamed, then the tumor is not subject, subject to these uh, checkpoint blockade immunotherapies. So in our laboratory, we're developing approaches to engineer molecules that would be pro-inflammatory molecules. And you might say, well, gosh, those pro-inflammatory molecules would be really toxic. Uh, so if you induce inflammation throughout the body. So in an approach that we're carrying out with another professor in PME, Juan Mendoza, we've made such a molecule that's masked. It's masked and inactive until it enters the tumor and becomes unmasked by presence in the tumor. So if we take those uh, tumors that are unresponsive to checkpoint blockade, so billion dollar drugs lead to 100% death in the animal. I don't prevent 100% death in the animal models. Now checkpoint blockade with these engineered molecules, which are called cytokines, can lead to complete survival. So instead of complete non-survival, complete survival by making cold tumors hot. I wanted to introduce one last vignette uh, that being related to vaccines. Uh, vaccines are totally on our minds these days, thinking about a COVID-19, a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. There are other approaches that we're exploring. We're exploring that uh, in, in full, uh, full throttle. But other approaches that I want to mention that you probably never heard of before. Uh, the idea of an inverse vaccine, the idea of a vaccine to prevent uh, something like an autoimmune reaction, to turn off an immune reaction. So I mentioned already that the incidence of autoimmune diseases is increasing over time uh, in, in all of these autoimmune indications, rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes. Wouldn't it be cool if you could have a vaccine that would prevent those autoimmune diseases in patients that are at risk or could turn around those autoimmune diseases in patients that have already begun to show symptoms of autoimmunity. So multiple sclerosis is one such autoimmune disease a, a, a disease that uh, leads to uh, defects in the nervous system, in the central nervous system, in the brain, and the spinal cord, that leads to uh, a variety of, of, uh, of, of pathologies, uh, including a loss of mobility. So in this case, we've developed an inverse vaccine, something that can turn off multiple sclerosis, and are using it in mouse models of multiple sclerosis. So these mice, are shown in black, that are not treated at all, or treated with a non-engineered vaccine in red, become quite paralyzed. They can't move their hind limbs at all. Their tail is flaccid. They sort of drag themselves around a, a, a cage on their front limbs. 
By contrast, though, if we treat in blue with an engineered vaccine, an inverse vaccine, we can completely avoid the symptomology of multiple sclerosis in these mouse models of this important disease much better than the state-of-the-art drug is. So black is a drug that's a, a clinical standard of care. We can outperform this clinical standard of care. So this is applicable to a number of autoimmune diseases. And in fact, we've started with this technology, a clinical trial recently in celiac disease, which is a sort of a semi-autoimmune disease that's attached to a food, to, to, uh, to gluten. Uh, and uh, that clinical trial has started uh, just before the, the, uh, the COVID crisis and the University of Chicago as a trial site for that. So lastly, could one extend those inverse vaccines to food allergies? I mentioned that like one out of 13 kids has a peanut allergy. Wouldn't it be cool if you could vaccinate to prevent food allergies with an inverse vaccine? In this case, that's what we've done here in collaboration with another PME and immunology professor, Catherine Nagler. Uh, so we've taken animals that are, that are prone to develop because of our model, prone to develop allergy against cow's milk, the second most prominent uh, food allergy and after peanut allergy. And if we vaccinate these animals, they don't develop cow's milk allergy at all. Whereas if we don't vaccinate the animals, they develop cow's milk allergy and enter anaphylaxis just like a human patient would. So with that, I, I wanna close up and, and say thank you very much for, for your attention. Uh, so we tried to show you some of the problems that we're solving or working on at least in the in immunoengineering in the Prisco School for Molecular Engineering. I'll turn the floor over to Matt Terrell now. Thank you, Jeff. So I'm, I'm gonna conclude this, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna conclude this technical discussion by talking about things that we're doing in a variety of material systems, largely aimed at questions of sustainability and health. The central theme of a lot of the uh, organic materials research in PME is a spontaneous process known as self-assembly, which means just what it says. You put the molecules together in a solution and they organize themselves into some interesting or useful structure. Maybe the simplest version of a uh, self-assembled structure are the micelles that form in your kitchen sink or in your washing machine or in your dishwasher that uh, are molecules that have ionic head groups and very hydrophobic tails. These want to come together to get the hydrophobic tails out of water. So that's the driving force for self-assembly with the uh, water soluble head groups sticking out, but this creates a very hydrophobic environment that dissolves the oil and grease that's on your hands or in your clothing or on your dishes. And so that's a, a simple kind of self-assembly process. A uh, more sophisticated one, also reversible under the right conditions, is the folding of a protein a particular sequence of amino acids that might have hydrophilic and hydrophobic amino acids, positively and negatively charged amino acids, has an information content in it that causes it to form spontaneously into a three-dimensional structure that may give it enzyme activity because of the particular shape of the molecule or antibody activity for the same reason. One can build synthetic mimics of proteins, and that's something that we've worked on in my lab quite a bit, where you combine the hydrophobic tail idea with a short uh, sequence of amino acids and get the tail to bring these short peptides together in some kind of globular or fibrous structure that mimics the natural uh, structures formed by proteins in biology. A simpler version that's a little bit like the surfactant version is block copolymers, where you have two chemically dissimilar uh, polymers that thermodynamically hate one another, but they're tied together by a strong bond in the middle. And the best they can do to get away from one another is form an organized periodic structure. And we're going to say more about that. 
one aspect of sustainability is sort of financial sustainability. And as many of you in the Bay Area may know, the uh, drive to make smaller and smaller transistors down to 10 nanometer feature size and below is creating enormous costs for microelectronics fabrication lines, which themselves cost hundreds of millions of dollars and the whole plant may have uh, 10 or more of these things. So for example, Taiwan uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Co Corporation spent almost $10 billion on a very recent uh, 30 centimeter wafer manufacturing facility in Taiwan. Paul Neely and Juan de Pablo in the PME hold a whole series of patents on using um, atomic level layer uh, chemical patterns to drive block copolymer assembly in useful ways uh, to um, drastically reduce the cost and improve the efficiency of making these small scale features. And I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I'm going to try to play a, a short video here, um, which is from, I'm going to start in the middle from a guy named Carl Skandemann, who works for Merck, which is a gigantic German conglomerate. Uh, and uh, he's going to explain how this works. For doing this patterning have become so complex can you hear that, Jeff? that they reportedly cost more than 100 We can hear it, we can't see it. Oh, And sorry. And up to factories contain dozens of these machines. You can't see it. So people are seriously... No, we cannot see it. This approach, long-term viable... No, but we can see it, we can hear it. We can do this chip manufacturing okay, in sorry. a totally different and much more cost-effective way using molecular engineering and mimicking nature down at the nanoscale dimensions of our transistors. Can you see it now? No. So the conventional yes. manufacturing takes no. every tiny feature of the circuit and projects it no. silicon. Okay. But if you look at the structure of an integrated circuit, the transistor are a bad experiment. This is um, a fellow who's um, working for a major electronics conglomerate in uh, Germany, uh, who is touting the work that uh, Paul Neely and Juan de Pablo have done in using this self-assembly process to create the patterns needed for integrated circuits. And this has been uh, adopted by the Semiconductor Industry Roadmap uh, to uh, really uh, start to play out in practice, so much so that uh, the uh, semiconductor companies are no longer funding uh, Paul and Juan's research because they've taken all the work in-house for technical development. The um, layered structures that I was telling you about uh, can be as small as 10 nanometers. So they're ideal for spontaneously forming the structures that you want, but you have to add a little extra ingredient. That's what this and, and uh, about a dozen other patents that Paul have. Because if you um, just allow these things to self-assemble on their own, you get this kind of wiggly fingerprint pattern that you see on the left. So you have to do something to direct the self-assembly uh, to get the kind of very regular pattern that you see on the right. And what you do is you create a pattern like this on the surface so that the lamellae will stand up perpendicular to the surface. But in fact, the pattern that you have to write can be three to five times bigger than the actual lamellar thickness. And so you get what they call a density multiplication, a 3x density multiplication. So you could write, you know, 90 nanometer stripes here with easier lithographic methods and get 30 nanometer features. And they've devised ways working with the European Semiconductor Organization, IMEC, to uh, do high throughput screening of the various conditions 
of lithography, both of the focus of the lithography and the dose of the radiation to determine the optimal conditions to get to small scale features like this 28 nanometer. And frankly, they're moving to much smaller uh, feature size with this technique. I also want to point out that the uh, one of the uh, researchers at IMEC in Belgium is Paulina Rincon Delgadillo, who is the first PhD alum of uh, uh, the PME, uh, graduating in 2014. So uh, they're working on this, and as you can imagine, it's not all as simple as, as you might get. There's all, as, as you might guess, there's, there's all kinds of things that have to do not only with the feature size and the uh, processing conditions, but the regularity and the roughness and the waviness of the features. But this is a, a very um, industry relevant uh, project going on within the PME. Another area of polymer science that the PME is working on, and this is in my lab in collaboration with a couple of others, is polyelectrolyte complexation. <clears throat> the kind of materials that you get spontaneously by pouring oppositely charged polymers together and having the poly positively charged polymer and the negatively charged polymer form a complex fluid as, as you see here. These kind of materials have been known for a long time. Uh, they were used in the early e-readers to keep the particles in a fine state of dispersion. I first became interested when we were in Santa Barbara uh, because there's a whole range of marine organisms that use um, uh, this kind of polyelectrolyte complex formation to glue habitat together. And there's an increasing interest in these complexes in fundamental biology because it turns out that within cells there are many, many sub organs, uh, sub cellular organelles uh, that don't have any membrane around them and are held together by these electrostatic forces. You can also make block copolymers out of these. So you can have a piece of the block copolymer that's charged and a piece that isn't. And uh, as you might guess, when you bring these together, you get micelle-like objects with the ionic species in the center and the non-ionic species in the outside. These are X-ray diffraction diagrams, and as you make these things more and more concentrated, that is, you squeeze these micelles together, just like in the earlier case, these things form ordered phases, spheres, cylinders, and lamellae, and we have used these to create uh, hydrogels that may be useful for tissue engineering and other kinds of encapsulation applications. The final thing that I want to say along these lines is that we've started to use these things to create small therapeutic nanoparticles where we um, have a positively charged polymer that complexes in the interior with a therapeutic nucleic acid. And uh, one gets a so-called polyelectrolyte complex uh, micelle with a peptide, a small piece of protein. I'm sorry, I don't, I've got something that's doing this automatically. With a small piece of protein that targets inflamed tissue. These, as you can see on the right, are small sort of 10 nanometer particles. And we have shown that delivering a therapeutic uh, nucleic acid can inhibit the inflammation that leads to the development of atherosclerosis in mice and hopefully in humans. So we have something where uh, a therapeutic agent that reduces the inflammation leading to atherosclerosis does not have to be, can be delivered systemically, but can be localized by the targeting peptide to the pathological tissue. And, and what the uh, uh, diagram, the data on the right show, is if you deliver this therapeutic agent naked without our micellar complex, it's a potent agent. It produces uh, a 57% 
reduction in the size of atherosclerotic lesions in this mouse model. But if you deliver it with our packaging, you get an 80% reduction. And we found that this uh, technique of delivering these therapeutic nucleic acids uh, works for other situations of inflamed blood vessels. And uh, the most interesting one recently is that in delivering these things to inflamed lung tissue, which might be a model for the acute respiratory distress system uh, syndrome, uh, which is uh, uh, causes of fatality, seems to reduce the inflammation uh, uh, in lung tissue uh, by uh, delivering uh, this uh, anti-inflammatory agent to the lung tissue of uh, mice that have been uh, artificially uh, uh, induced inflammation. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I, we've tried very hard to give you an informative and comprehensive overview of work going on in the Pritzker School for Molecular Engineering, and we are here for as long as anybody would like to make comments or ask questions about our presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, Jeff, and David. And as you just mentioned, um, now you know the floor is open to the participants to ask questions of the panelists. You know, there, it's a lot of it's a fascinating and in, incredible institute and school they have an approach to tackling big problems. Um, but I think it's complex as well. But the Booth graduates are smart. So, you know, what questions do you have for, for the panelists? Okay, I'll ask a question then to get it going. You know, you talked about energy um, and as one of the uh, legs or focuses in, in the school's research portfolio and focus. What specifically, because it's a lot of, it's an area that I've spent a lot of my career in, in uh, different energy systems, more at the macro scale. Um, but what are you working on in that area? Well, we have a really uh, good uh, platform to do a variety of energy related research because of our connection with Argon. But specifically, um, I would say, uh, the uh, principal areas of energy-related research have to do with energy storage. Uh, new battery materials, uh, new electrodes, uh, and, and electrolytes for enhanced energy storage. Um, the um, Argon is uh, the site of the Department of Energy's battery hub. So about $25 million a year in one grant called the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research uh, comes into Argonne. And uh, there's three, uh, maybe four uh, PME faculty members uh, doing research uh, <clears throat> on batteries connected with Argonne. That's, that's the main thing. And it, it is mainly focused around new materials for the various battery components. And David mentioned grid, um, I think, applications potentially. So I think, you know, my understanding going forward, if we're considering a, a transformation of power generation and supply of renewables together with storage, together with natural gas, maybe in the short term, you know, it requires a much higher level of grid and a different level of grid control. Are you doing anything in the computational space or do you see anything in that computational space that might be applied in that area or not needed? Uh, well, it's an interesting question, Paul. I mean, we are not doing anything in that space. Uh, we are working with partner companies that are thinking quite a bit about that as a way to deploy uh, broad sets of centers to monitor energy use and distribute very, very quickly and simultaneously. So I think it'll be a more efficient distribution system through quantum sensing, but we're not doing that ourselves. Okay. A couple of questions there. The, the first one's for David. Can, can, have you looked at it, David, or should I read it to you? 
Um, maybe you could read it. I, I don't see it for some reason. Okay. It says, how is quantum engineering different from nanoscience and technology? Where yeah. academics spent a lot of time and effort over the last couple of decades. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so you're right. I mean, nanoscience and technology is a really thriving field where people largely are looking at classical electronic properties that happen when you make materials at the micron or submicron scale. Quantum technologies tend to appear when you get down to the level of single atoms, single electrons, single photons. And I think previously people thought this would be a really hard area to work in and that how could you how could you control one electron or one atom? It's hard to even buy a single electron transistor today. And then there's some changes in both materials development, control technologies, and some science. It became clear you could actually manipulate individual quanta of nature. And that's launched this area of quantum engineering, which really focuses on the quantum mechanical properties of matter, not what happens when you make matter small. There's a couple of questions coming here about uh translation and commercialization. Jeff, would you, you say a few words, but I'll, I'll read the specific questions unless you can see them yourself. Yeah, I was reading them myself. I see. So, um, so talk about commercialization a little and, and to the extent that you can, connections with Booth. Absolutely. So one of the instruments that Booth has been involved in, in uh, helping create uh, at the University of Chicago is the Polsky Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship which exists not just as a technology transfer office, meaning not just in responsive mode to negotiate license agreements and out license, rather to also uh, be, be proactive in company foundation. Uh, so the, several of the PME faculty are involved with Booth then uh, through Polsky uh, Center in company foundation. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the Polsky Center can uh, can essentially assign or, or uh, um, second, second of uh, their, some of their staff to individual faculty collaborations for company creation. So for example, in this um, in cancer immunotherapy area that I was mentioning is one of the vignettes from my lab. Uh, we've started a company from, from that technology by licensing from the, from the university. And Polsky Center is very active in helping uh, the founders, myself included, uh, raise capital uh, from venture sources to drive that forward. Uh, that, that works very well because the uh, Polsky is really very, the center is very proactive, as I mentioned, in, in seeing that happen. And I should just add that even in the quantum area, which is, I would say, significantly farther away than what Jeff has been talking about, uh, the PME has been filing an extraordinarily large number of patents working with Polsky. And the quantum exchange has just hired a uh, um, industrial director to help direct the evolution of these discoveries into companies that's been very, very successful, so. I see there's a question about how one might use quantum communication or entanglement to the financial industry. Um, so actually that's something we've been speaking with some financial companies about in the last six months alone in the Chicago area. And I would say there are I mean, you, yeah, you, right, with faculty of Booth, exactly. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of things that are emerging. So in the next 10 years, uh, the financial industries are obviously very interested in secure communication, where, as I mentioned, one of the basic properties of quantum data is looking at it destroys it, right? The act of observing something changes it. And while that's normally thought as a liability, you know, for a quantum network, that's fantastic because one of the most common ways of taking information without you knowing is to extract the information copy it, put it back in the channel and let you receive it. And how do you know anyone's looked at your information? So with quantum information, it's built into the physics of the system. There is no way to take it and replace it. So that's one thing that we believe probably the next five years in metropolitan networks will be happening with the financial industry. And the second is, in, is and I'll just say this one last example, is something called blind computing. Where one of the interesting properties of a quantum computer is it can be designed in a way that the owner of the machine has no way of knowing what the machine is doing. So it's another level of built-in security. And these are two areas that we see emerging in the financial industry. There's a general question about timeframes for seeing real solutions. You know, I, I think, you know, Jeff is uh, producing real solutions all the time. 
um, you know, at least to the point of, of clinical trials in, in terms of time scale. But by that I mean, as David alluded to, some of the biomedical things are closer to realization than some of the quantum things. It's even true of, of some of our work. I, I think we could uh, move some of this uh, targeted inflammation therapy uh, for um, cardiovascular and and possibly lung inflammation. Uh, there it's a question of, of money. Um, uh, so, you know, some of the, the biomedical things, I think, you know, one will see the outcomes in, you know, three to five years. The, the quantum stuff is maybe more five to 10 years or, or something like that, uh, I think as a typical time scale. There's another yeah, so for, for, Go ahead, Jeff. For example, with the, the celiac inverse vaccine that uh, we just introduced into clinical trials, the time scale there from conception to first patient treated was about five years. Yeah. To product is going to be longer than that, but to first patient treated, five years. Right, right. There's an interesting question about federal funding. I mean, mm -hmm. actually, the, the federal funding environment has been very good and, and even because of the public health situation an infusion of money for certain kinds of research has has made federal funding even more available so right now uh, lack of funding isn't the principal issue that we're struggling with <laughs> the big issue is actually being able to get into our laboratories um, which we uh, started to do again this week um, the long range implications of the government having borrowed a couple of trillion dollars and whether it will be able to pay its debts in the future might affect the federal funding situation down the road, but that's, that's not an immediate concern. Yeah, but I think the other thing that's interesting about, about some of the federal funding, for example, in the quantum areas is changing the way the work is done. So I think quite a, a few people realize you need to blur the interface between academia and industry in a way to translate some of the science and technology far more efficiently. And that's being baked into some of the federal calls right now. So that's actually quite interesting and very attractive to students. There's a couple of questions here that I'll try to tackle. And then there's one back on quantum applications, David, that you might think about while I'm talking. Um, I see it, yeah. Do, do you think other traditional engineering programs will move to a more interdisciplinary problem focused approach like PME? And then another question, while I understand the research from a PhD postdoc point of view, how's the undergraduate curriculum designed? Uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard to say. There are a couple of other places that have now adopted the name molecular engineering, although we were there first. The two principal ones, and we've started to form a little bit of a club, is the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, which has an Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering, or Molecular Engineering and Science, and then uh, Imperial College in London that uh, has started a, a interdisciplinary molecular engineering program. None of them have the really firm foundation in the university administration that we have with our own tenured faculty lines, uh, you know, kind of uh, control of our own destiny moving forward. Now that we're a school, you know, this isn't, it, it's clear that we're here to stay. The, the undergraduate program has been the most challenging thing that we've done. And I'd say it's still a work in progress. You know, with PhD students and postdocs, um, if you give them good problems uh, to work on, uh, the coursework education is a less important part of their overall experience. I'm not saying it's not important, but compared to the good research environment, it's not so important. The undergrads, you have to teach them something. And we have uh, some ideas about we, of what we think constitutes a, a good uh, core fundamentals, you know, that every engineer should know. I was Dean of Engineering at, at UC Santa Barbara for 10 years. And, you know, we had chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on. And you, you find <clears throat> that, you know, many of the traditional engineering departments teach the same stuff. 
they teach thermodynamics and they teach fluid mechanics and they teach uh, things about um, you know mechanics and so on. We can teach our students that. Uh, if you're in a chemical engineering department, you tend to use chemical engineering examples. If you're in a bioengineering department, you tend to use bioengineering examples. We're trying to expose our students to the fundamental topics in engineering with a kind of discipline agnostic point of view to realize that the principles they're learning apply across a wide range of engineering problems. But after the fundamentals, we're giving our students more and more opportunities to pursue more specialized directions along the lines of the tracks of research that we talked about in quantum engineering, in bioengineering, and in material science and engineering. So that's, that's pretty much how we're doing it. Why don't you say something about this um, privacy and civil liberties thing for quantum applications, David? Well, I could speak a bit to privacy, which is um, how do things change when data is prepared in a way that um, without knowing exactly how to observe it, you destroy it. So that offers extraordinary opportunities for privacy. And people have been thinking about how that could change society in interesting ways, like voting. For example, you know, there are studies that suggest that there'd be a large turnout for voting if you could do it reliably from your home. And there was absolutely no way that somebody could know how you voted. The only thing they would know is that you did vote, but they wouldn't know how, and there's no way to know how. So being able to handle data in a very secure and private way could affect civil interactions in unusual directions. Um, the same with medical information is something that I always need to talk to Jeff about. You know, there's a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical companies and how you secure information and data in a way that's just there's just no way to extract it. And in fact, it changes the way you even think about encrypting or using firewalls. Can you just leave your data exposed because there's no way to actually to interpret it? It's just not possible. So I, I can't speak to the civil liberties aspect, but I think it will change the way people think about the freedom of exposing data when they know it's ultimately very secure. Thanks. Um, so there's a, not necessarily final question, but one so far remaining question about Argonne and New Chicago and accomplishments in the area of transportation and energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, maybe the best way to say what's going on at Argonne is that, you know, there are basically four projects at Argonne where um, uh, U Chicago faculty members in PME are either the principal investigators or active participants. David leads uh, a project at Argonne that is directed uh, toward uh, a particular aspect of uh, quantum engineering that he didn't emphasize, but it was the, really the first thing that has to do with how do you switch uh, quantum information with fidelity between different modes of uh, action, uh, you know, sort of quantum transducers uh, between different modes of the signal. Um, and that's, that's what's called an FWP in DOE language, meaning a field work project. So DOE has given money to David at Argonne uh, so that Argonne has uh, uh, you know, a, a project in this area. The work I talked about with ionic polymers is another project at Argonne with uh, Paul Neely as the principal investigator. Julia Dolly, uh, one of our colleagues, leads a uh, project on computation, uh, computational science methods at Argonne. And then finally, there's the battery research that I mentioned to Paul er early on. So there's, there's quite a few areas now where PME is actively participating with Argonne scientists at Argonne. It's, 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 at Argonne. it's probably worth saying to the topics that Matt just talked about, there's an enormous advantage of being able to work with Argonne because many of these properties require understanding matter at the level of individual atoms or below and tools like the synchrotron at Argonne 
and the advanced computational facilities are unparalleled. And it gives us an opportunity to study things in ways that would be difficult or almost impossible to do elsewhere. We probably don't have time to give this last question justice, but give it a shot, Jeff, about. I'll give it a couple minutes at least. So, <laughs> so uh, there's actually quite a bit of work on COVID-19 uh, going on in the PME. Uh, when the university shut down, it allowed essential research to continue, which included COVID-19 oriented research. Uh, so there are uh, three investigators in PME who are working on vaccine technology, the collaboration between my lab and Melody Swartz in one approach and Aaron Isakhan in another approach involving also technology from our lab. So, uh, so these technologies and vaccines, they won't be the first ones off the block. There are already several clinical trials that are running, but they're all focused at patients who will be more at risk and poorly served or, or less well served uh, by current vaccine technology, which includes the elderly. Uh, so even to the flu vaccine that, that you get every season, uh, they, the elderly uh, r r respond quite poorly to the flu vaccine. And so we're trying to come up with approaches that would be more, uh, more appropriate for those at-risk patients. There's worked on acute respiratory distress syndrome that Matt mentioned that leads to these pulmonary failure in patients. Matt has a project there. Terrell, uh, so my laboratory has a project there. And there's work in characterizing antibodies that are produced by uh, patients that respond well, uh, analyzing those antibodies and ask what can we learn about the vaccine response that Juan Mendoza is carrying out. Finally, going back to the micro devices that I mentioned, Savash Tai in our, in our institute is working on micro device based diagnostic approaches, both for testing for the virus as well as testing for uh, pre-existing immunity based on, uh, based on infection. So those are some of the projects that are going on in the, in, and have been going on throughout the shutdown since we've been able to keep our research efforts up. I think we're coming up against the uh, end here. We could go on forever because, you know, just fascinating talks and you can just feel it. How, how great a school and program you have at the PME. Um, I want to congratulate you and we all do on the work you've done for a decade and will continue to do. So thank you. Um, I think we have a slide that shows the, um, for, for the participants who would like to engage with PME and reach out. So that's the purpose and one of the key goals of this event today is to uh, promote engagement and people who are in, in, you know, alumni and enterprises that are interested in the work and continue a dialogue. So these are the primary contacts at PME. I'm sure you can find ways also to, to reach the panelists today. Um, and, and I'd wanna thank everyone for their participation in, in muscling through a lot of difficult material, but I, I know we're all up to it. So again, I wanna thank the panelists and everyone who participated. And I think uh, that we'll call it uh, end of the uh, discussion for now. Well, thank you very much. We're honored by the invitation and really appreciate the collaboration that we have with Booth and all of our University of Chicago colleagues. So thank you very much again. Everyone, thank you as well. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.